Gene transfection is a promising technology that relies on the transfer of genetic material into cells. In the wake of the COVID pandemic, this technology saw widespread application in the development of DNA and RNA-based vaccines. In this video, we will do two things. First, we will take a look at the general mechanism of gene transfection. And in this part, we will try to make things as understandable as possible for everybody. After that, we would like to share the results of our latest publication on the topic, in which we describe a transfection vector that recognizes cancer cells. And there we will also dive a bit deeper into the nitty-gritty details. So, if you're already an expert on the topic, you might want to use the navigation bar to skip to that very section. But since you're still here, let's ask ourselves, what is the general idea behind gene transfection? Let's start with a quick recap of protein synthesis. Cells store information about proteins and RNAs in DNA molecules, which are located in the nucleus. In order to produce a protein, a copy of the genetic information is transcribed onto messenger RNA, which is then transported outside the nucleus. There, at the ribosome, this information is used as a template for the production of proteins. So, it's a bit like transporting blueprints from headquarters to the factory and gene transfection aims exactly at this process. However, for transient gene transfection, the plan is not to change the original plan inside the headquarters, but to smuggle in some additional information somewhere along this pathway in order to hijack the cell's own protein production capacity and thus make it produce, well, whatever protein we want. And that is the key idea behind gene therapy. We introduce a little bit of genetic material at the right position and from that the cell makes a lot of protein. Which can then do, well, whatever this particular protein does. In the case of a COVID vaccine, the cell is told to produce the spike protein of the coronavirus so that the body can form antibodies against this particular structure without having to deal with all the rest of the virus. All we need for that is a piece of DNA or RNA which encodes for this particular protein. And engineering a DNA sequence which encodes for a known amino acid sequence is quite straightforward nowadays. However, there is still a problem. How do we get the DNA molecules into the cell? And more precisely, how do we get it exactly to the right location inside a cell? It is exactly that process which is called gene transfection. And the tools that we use for it are called transfection vectors. They smuggle the DNA or RNA molecules to just the right location inside the cell so that its code can be read and fed into the protein synthesis pipeline. If we would just add naked DNA molecules to a cell, nothing would happen as cells haven't really evolved to process just any genetic material lying around. Otherwise, any old bit of genetic material could just hijack the cell's production capacity for its own good. For example, in order to manipulate the cells so that it makes more copies of the offending bit of information. This is precisely what a virus does. Therefore, cells have evolved several barriers that the DNA molecule has to overcome before its information can be read transcribed and converted into proteins. Cellular membranes play an important role in this protection. In order to achieve gene transfection, a DNA molecule has to overcome the cellular membrane and the nuclear membrane. And in between those two barriers, several processes just wait for their chance to turn our carefully coded DNA polymer into simple monomeric nucleotides. And while those are quite nutritious for the cell, they won't make it produce the protein that we want. So from the view of a DNA molecule, the cell looks a bit like a castle with an outer and an inner wall of defense and a killing ground in between. Some might think that RNA molecules have it much easier as they don't have to pass through the nuclear membrane. That's true, but on the other hand, they are less metabolically stable, so they don't get a free pass either. That's why we need the transfection vectors. As mentioned before, viruses are very much adept at channeling either DNA or RNA into cells. And by that they hijack the cell's production capacity in order to make more viruses. 
And it is indeed possible to use virus hulls as transfection vectors, as they have evolved in order to overcome the cellular defenses. This was done for the vaccines of AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson in order to channel the blueprint for the spike protein into the nucleus, as those two vaccines both used DNA. The RNA vaccines from BioNTech and Moderna, on the other hand, used chemical vectors. In order to understand what these vectors do, let's take a closer look at what they have to achieve in order to overcome the different cellular barriers. The key building blocks for cellular membranes are phospholipids. These diesters of phosphoric acid are deprotonated at a physiological pH. This means that a cellular membrane carries a lot of negative charges. A phosphodiester linkage is also used to connect to nucleosides in a DNA molecule. So, naked DNA is also negatively charged and thus repelled from a cellular membrane. One thing a transfection vector must do is compensate for this negative charge. Therefore, most transfection vectors carry amine groups which are protonated under physiological pH and thus are positively charged. A simple example would be polyethylene amine or PI for short. It can condense DNA to just the right size for cellular uptake. DNA condensation also protects the molecule from degradation. So it's an overall useful thing. But how can such an adduct, the diameter of which is approximately 100 times larger than that of the phospholipid bilayer, pass through such a membrane? Therefore, the cellular membrane can engulf the DNA vector adduct and form an endosome around it, which is then transported into the cell. This process is called endocytosis. But if we get the cell to do this, we are still not home and dry. This is because these endosomes are then acidified and broken down in order to degrade whatever they have engulfed. So, our DNA vector complex needs to escape from the endosome before it's chewed up. And one hypothesis about how such a vector can help with this is the so-called proton sponge effect. Given the high nitrogen density in pi, not all of the nitrogen atoms are protonated under physiological pH. Thus, acidification of the endosome can be buffered to a certain degree. However, since every positive proton which is pumped into the vesicle is accompanied by a negative anion, the overall ion concentration and thus the osmotic pressure in the vesicle is increased until it bursts. Now the DNA vector complex is free again and can make its way to the nucleus. Since pi protects the condensed DNA molecules from degradation, all the vector complex needs to do is to wait around until the cell undergoes mitosis, during which the nuclear envelope is broken down. And voila, we got our genetic information where it needs to be, inside the nucleus. Now it can influence the protein synthesis machinery and we have achieved transfection. But endocytosis is not the only mechanism by which a vector can work. For example, cationic lipids can be used to form protective vesicles around DNA molecules. They can either be engulfed as a whole or fused with the cellular membrane and thereby release their cargo into the cell. This process is called lipofection and it is the basis for another prominent transfection vector called lipofectamine which is actually not a single compound, but rather a mix of two cationic lipids shown here. While there are several more methods for gene transfection, including so-called gene guns, which literally shoot the genetic material into the cell, this brief and definitely incomplete introduction should be enough to serve as a basis for discussing our latest contribution to the field. Since complex organisms consist of many different types of cells, an ability to transfect a particular cell type selectively would be very useful. Being able to selectively address cancer cells, for example, would open up a whole new avenue towards potential treatments. Many cancer cells overexpress certain receptors at the cellular surface. So, since we want our vector to interact with the surface anyway, why not attach a ligand for such a receptor to our transfection vector? 
This way, the interaction of the DNA vector complex and the cellular surface could be enhanced for a given cell type and thus transfection could occur much more easily. Well, there are not that many reports in the literature which describe something like this, so things are probably not as simple as that. One reason for this might be that a transfection vector already has quite a lot to do, as we have discussed in the introductory part, which you might have heard just a minute ago. For example, it has to interact with both the DNA and the phospholipid membrane and attaching additional bits won't necessarily be helpful here. One report by Wang and co-workers described a quite interesting effect here. They used a highly efficient polybeta amino acid ester based vector to which they attached folate as a targeting moiety. This way they achieved an up to three times higher transfection rate for HeLa cells, which are rich in folate receptors, compared to other cell types which don't overexpress this type of receptor. What we found particularly interesting in this study was that increasing folate density on the polymer significantly reduced efficiency as increasing hydrophobicity and thus larger polyplexes led to a decrease in transfection efficiency. This result confirmed our intuition on the topic. The more of a molecule is used for targeting, the less is left for DNA binding. For this reason we chose on the one hand a neutral targeting unit and on the other hand the strongest anion binder out there as the basis for our transfection vector. Ammonium ions provide comparatively weak interactions with organic anions. So a peptidic transfection vector that relies on this type of interaction needs quite a lot of those moieties. A guanidinium moiety is already a better anion binder than an ammonium ion as the adionic interaction is complemented by additional hydrogen bonds. Therefore, octaarginine and corresponding conjugates can be used for transfection. But the Schmuck GCP motif is by far the best anion binder currently available. This tailor-made motif relies on ionic interactions as well as a well-designed array of hydrogen bonds. With it, the smallest peptidic transfection vector had been realized in 2015 and it uses only four lysine molecules which have been modified with the GCP binding unit. The resulting small molecule vector is of similar size to a lot of targeting moieties and we chose biotin as biotin receptors are overexpressed on a lot of cancer cell lines. Connecting the two bits with a suitable linker took some development and length, water solubility and number of charges had to be optimized. With the final vector, however, we were able to achieve a tenfold selectivity for cell lines which overexpress biotin receptors over suitable controls. A good way to optimize transaction vectors is to see if they can be used to transfer plasmids which encode for fluorescent proteins such as GFP or mCherry. We used the red mCherry which was fused to the nuclear localized protein histone H2. This way the reporter signal was concentrated in one compartment and allowed for better readout and recognition. Using the classic pi vector transfection can be achieved with HeLa cells upon which they start to glow red. HeLa cells overexpress biotin receptors on their surface. And with our vector system transfection was also possible, although not quite as effective as with pi. So have we just made a somewhat less efficient transfection vector by attaching biotin or what? Well, the first interesting result is that no transfection is possible with our vector if only the biotin targeting moiety is removed. This indicates that biotin must be somehow complicit in the transfection process and that the transfection vector is no good without this additional factor. This can also be seen when a cell line is used that doesn't exhibit as many biotin receptors on the cellular surface, such as the HEC293T cell line. Here, transfection with pi occurs as readily as with Heller cells. With our transfection vector, however, the transfection efficacy is visibly reduced, as now there are no receptors available for the biotin targeting moiety. Indeed, the transfection efficacy is somewhat similar to that of the biotin-free control vector for the cell line. While these pictures of glowing cells are all nice and pretty, they hardly count as proper quantification and counting out by hand would be way too much work or give way to confirmation bias.
We thus used an automated quantification pipeline which identifies and counts nuclei and then quantifies the ones that express the fluorescence signal. From this, a percentage of transfected cells can be calculated. And this heat map here shows the result for five cell lines. The two columns on the left contain the data for biotin receptor positive and the three on the right for biotin receptor negative cell lines. It can be seen immediately that Pi is quite efficient in transfecting all cell lines. Our vector, on the other hand, displays a clear preference for biotin receptor rich cell lines, which are transfected with a 10 times greater efficacy compared to cell lines with less biotin receptors at their cellular surface. We were particularly happy about the good transfection results for A549 cells, which overexpress biotrained receptors and can indeed be a little bit stroppy when classical transfection vectors are used. Here our vector was even better than pi. Supported by the fact that our control vector, which lacked the biotin moiety entirely, wasn't able to transfect anything very well, it became quite clear that the biotin label must play a pivotal role in the transfection process of our vector. This was further confirmed by an experiment in which transfection of HeLa cells was quenched in a concentration-dependent manner upon addition of a competing biotin ligand. Transfection could also be quenched by addition of bafilomycin, which is known to interfere with endosomal escape. These observations thus point to a biotin-receptor-dependent endocytotic transfection mechanism for our vector system. So, to conclude, we are happy to report that we have developed a cell-specific transfection vector which shows an order of magnitude selectivity for biotin-rich cell lines over suitable controls. If you want to dive deeper into this topic and read all about the optimization of this vector system, its physico-chemical characterization and a more detailed account of its potential for transfection, check out our article in Chemistry a European Journal. T. Stilksmeyer and Paul Stahl share first author on this publication and the article is available free of charge as the University of Duisburg-Essen was kind enough to pay for open source publication. We also wish to express our gratitude to Evonik and the DFG for funding. But the last words of this video must be about this man. Carsten Schmuck, the inventor of the GCP motive and original supervisor of this project. He passed away in 2019 and far too early in his life. He is dearly missed here in Essen, where we got to know him as a passionate scientist, valued colleague, dedicated teacher, gracious mentor and overall wonderful friend. We miss you, Carsten.